Chapter 28, Part 2 on Civil Wars, Liberal Crisis and Conservative Rebirth, 1961-1972. So we left off Part 1 with the Gulf of Tonkin incident, and this would be the spark that would, that would change America's association in Vietnam from advisorship to actual, actually military, you know, uh, operation. Uh, where you know Lyndon Johnson reacts uh, pretty strongly to, to this incident, and and the next thing you know, you're in a full-scale war. Uh, so we're going to watch a couple of back-to-back -back, uh, short film clips here of President Johnson talking about Vietnam. Uh, the first one I want you to watch right now. Uh, please watch the film entitled "President Lyndon Johnson: Why We Are in Vietnam," and we're going to watch both of these pretty pretty close together here. And we're going to see how, well, first of all, this is the, you know, mid-60s, so, so the media wasn't quite as polished as it is today, and it's not, and the news was not an entertainment, you know, choice as like it is today. Uh, in those days, the people were very serious and to the point, and, and that was kind of it. So uh, Johnson, perhaps not Mr. Personality in, in both of these clips, but some, but some interesting and, and important information that, he, that he's getting across to us. This first clip he... He's, uh, you know, talking about, you know, why why the the country's involved is going to be involved in this war, and then the second one he'll he kind of backsteps a little bit. He seems a little bit frazzled as the war is going on. So go ahead and watch why we are in Vietnam, and then come on back. Okay, so Johnson develops a bombing campaign. Uh, this is called Operation Rolling Thunder, and the campaign was initially. Uh, supposed to be eight weeks, but it lasted for three years. Uh, Johnson immediately sent in 3,500 Marines. So these people are not advisors. And, and the war spun out of control. Um, Johnson began a policy of a sustained bombing of North Vietnam, uh, just relentless bombing. And, and it truly was out of frustration by him. Uh, so he turned to this more extensive use of air power. Uh, so Operation Rolling Thunder was this bombing campaign. The first Rolling Thunder mission took place on March 2nd, 1965, when 100 American and South Vietnamese planes struck an ammunition dump 100 miles southeast of Hanoi. In July 1966, Rolling Thunder was expanded to include North Vietnamese oil storage facilities. And in the spring of, of 1967, it was further expanded to include power plants, factories, and airfields in the Hanoi area. Of course, Hanoi was the capital of North Vietnam. Uh, so again, only supposed to last for eight weeks, but it, it ends up being three years. Uh, so looking at, at our at our map here again, uh, Hanoi is up here in the north, the capital of North Vietnam, and most of the Operation Rolling Thunder uh, bombing campaigns were around the city of, of Hanoi. And we talked before about the demilitarized zone, the DMZs, the kind of the border between North and South, Communist North, Republic South. And then, of course, Saigon, uh, is, as it was called in those days, the capital of, of South Vietnam. Um, so Operation Rolling Thunder was controlled by the White House. Uh, and at times, the bombing targets were personally selected by Johnson himself. Uh, between 1965 and... 1968, about 643,000 tons, 643,000 tons of bombs were dropped on Vietnam, North Vietnam. A total of nearly 900 U.S. aircraft was lost during Operation Rolling Thunder and, of course, the loss of very many American soldiers. Uh, the operation continued with occasional suspensions until President Johnson, under increasing domestic political pressure, stopped it on October 31st. 1968. Let's go to our next film about Johnson, and this one's called Lyndon B. Johnson's Speech on Vietnam. And while it's similar, you, you see these, he's, he's somewhat backed down from, from the approach he had initially. Go ahead and watch that second film. Okay, so Vietnam deteriorated into a directionless war. Bombing raids that were really not that successful, but were killing a large number of civilians. So again, you're not supposed to you know, kill civilians if you can help it. Um, it, it the uh, Geneva Convention, you know, s states that countries at war should do all they can to avoid civilian uh, casualties. But here you're bombing, you know, a city or, you know, at least, uh, you know, a, around a city. 
Uh, but it, it also was a guerrilla war. And we talked about the guerrilla wars in the, in the Philippines, in Cuba. You know, it's a different type of, of geography. And you're talking about, a, a, you know, a tropical kind of area, uh, very wet, very hot. Uh, it's difficult to maneuver troops around an area like that. Uh, deep, thick jungle. It rained all the time. The soldiers were constantly wet. So it was a difficult war to, to, to gain a foothold with. Uh, but then in January 1968, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, uh, launched the Tet Offensive. Uh, January 1968. North Vietnam attacks dozens of targets in South Vietnam. A major shock and surprise, and the North Vietnamese took control of the war. And they did this during the Lunar New Year, or the Tet Holiday. North Vietnamese and Communist Viet Cong forces launched a coordinated attack against several targets in South Vietnam. So hitting, hitting different targets at the same time took a lot of planning. Uh, the United States and South Vietnamese military sustained heavy losses before finally repelling the communist assault. Uh, this played an important role in weakening U.S. public support for the war in Vietnam. Let's go to our next film. Please watch the film, How the Tet Offensive Changed the Vietnam War, and then come on back. Okay, so Ho Chi Minh, the Communist Revolutionary Leader, the Prime Minister, then later President of North Vietnam. We talked about him first in the China War, and other leaders. They planned the Tet Offensive in the hopes of achieving a decisive victory that would, that would end the grinding conflict, because it frustrated military leaders on both sides. Neither side was gaining on the other. Uh, so it was believed that a successful attack on major cities might force the United States to negotiate or perhaps even to withdraw completely. Uh, at the very least, they hoped it would stop the ongoing escalation of guerrilla attacks and bombing in the north. So the Tet holiday was chosen as the time to strike because it was a traditionally, I'm sorry, because it was traditionally a time of truce, because it's a holiday, and because Vietnamese traveling, because Vietnamese were traveling to spend their, the festival with their relatives. So it provided cover for the offensive, and then they were criticized for this by other countries to to choose a you know a somewhat of a, a, a agreed upon time of a truce during a war to to for people to spend time with their families, and they did it anyway, and citing the fact that it gave us cover. Uh, so it's so it was a big deal. The Tet Offensive is a big deal, a major major part of the Vietnam War. Absolute shock to America and South Vietnam. Uh, the assault began with, the, with the, as I said before, a simultaneous attack on several targets in mostly populated areas. So again, a lot of civilians, but they also chose chose those uh, those areas because of the heavy United States troop presence. Uh, so the Tet offensive uh, struck at the major cities of Hue and Saigon in in uh, South Vietnam. Uh, so the, the success of the Tet Offensive had a strong psychological impact on the Americans at home. Uh, the North Vietnamese Army was not as weak as Johnson had suggested. Uh, Johnson had previously claimed that, that they were no match for the United States and that this war will be, you know, uh, ended with the victory. But here they're taking, uh, you know, the ad advantage and in, in, in getting the foothold and, and have control of the war. Uh, so the offensive uh, actually hit the outer walls of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. A second phase also launched simultaneous assaults on smaller cities and towns. A third phase began in August and lasted six weeks. This lasted, lasted for a long time. Uh, however, the United States and South Vietnamese forces were able to retake the towns that had been secured over the course of the offensive, but they incurred heavy military and civilian casualties in the process. Uh, so at the end of the Tet Offensive, both sides had endured much losses, but also both sides claimed victory. Uh, the United States and South Vietnamese military response regained all of the lost territory, but very key, it weakened domestic support for the Johnson administration. As the vivid reporting on the Tet Offensive by the U.S. media, again, there's television, made it clear to the American public that an overall victory in Vietnam was not imminent, not guaranteed. 
Uh, the aftermath brought public discussions about de-escalation, but not before United States generals asked for additional troops for a wide-scale accelerated pacification program, an objective of expanding government control uh, over 1,200 villages uh, con controlled by the Viet Cong. So apparently they hadn't learned very much from the strategic, st strategic Hamlet disaster. Uh, also, because the Viet Cong had been weakened by the Tet Offensive, by the American response, uh, many in, in, uh, generals especially believed it was in position to defeat the North. So these generals pushed Johnson for an all-out U.S. and South Vietnam offensive against the North. We, we've got them where we want them now. We've weakened them. But Johnson saw it differently uh, and, and you know, proven that he was frustrated beyond you know, reproach. Uh, he announced that the bombing of North Vietnam would cease above the 20th parallel. And he placed a limit on U.S. troops in South Vietnam. So it, it really does work. The, the Tet Offensive does force Johnson to back down, for America to back down. Johnson also uh, wants peace talks. He wants to get together in, in some place, you know, neutral and, and have a uh, discussion about you know ending this war uh, that would not end up happening for several several more years and we'll learn why here in a minute uh, so of course the protests back at home in, in America the Tet Offensive increased the anti-war movement in the United States uh, this movement intensifies March 31st 1968 uh, to the shock of, of the country Johnson announced that he would not seek a second term as president so remember he finished Kennedy's term he ran in 64 for his own term so he was eligible to run for another term but he says no I I, I don't want to run and if and if you um, uh, if you elect me I will not serve so don't don't do that you get somebody else Johnson pulls out uh, the job of, of finding a way out of Vietnam was left to the next US president which would be Richard Nixon so the Tet, the Tet Offensive and his escalation of the war, and especially his relentless bombing campaigns, Operation Rolling Thunder, drove Lyndon Johnson out of office, and he refused to run for a second term in 68. Uh, at that time, when he, when he stepped down, there were 500,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam when he left office. So, of course, the next president is Richard Nixon. Uh, he becomes uh, starts to starts to serve as president in 1969. Uh, of course, this presidency will end in disgrace when he was when he was forced to resign because of the Watergate incident that we'll talk about in the next chapter or so. Uh, so I talked about the Paris peace talks in 1968. The Paris peace talks were begun. Uh, the United States and Hanoi agreed to enter into preliminary peace talks in Paris in 1968. But as soon as the talks were started, they stalled. Uh, the only thing the two sides could agree upon was the shape of the conference table. Uh, so these talks that were intended to put an end to the then 13-year-long Vietnam War, you know, have trouble getting started. But at least, at least they're negotiating. But, but they would actually fail because an aide working for then presidential candidate, Richard Nixon, convinced the South Vietnamese to walk away from the dealings, from the peace talks. Of course, this was done in secret. Uh, Nixon's presidential campaign needed the war to continue since Nixon was running on a platform that opposed the war. Uh, Nixon feared a breakthrough at the Paris peace talks, designed to fund a negotiated settlement to the Vietnam War, would derail his campaign and disallow him from being the hero that ended the war. Uh, so Nixon undermines the Paris peace talks, uh, which is one of the most uh, you know, horrific moments in American history that a, that a, a, a then presidential candidate would, would uh, take action to, to uh, prolong a war so he could be the person that ends it to be the hero. And this, this costs thousands of American lives because the war continued for five more years. 
Uh, let's watch our next film. Please watch the film Vietnam War Nixon Undermined Peace Talks. And this is an interesting film. You actually can hear a telephone conversation between Johnson and Nixon um, talking about this. Go ahead and watch that film. <clears throat> okay, so Nixon prolonged the Vietnam War for political gain. So, you know, Nixon was a very interesting personality in American history. He was a narcissist who was obsessed with his place in history. Uh, eventually, Nixon would win in 1968, very close by just 1% of the popular vote. And this was from the BBC. Uh, once in office, he escalated the war into Laos and Cambodia with the loss of an additional 22,000 American lives before finally settling for a peace agreement in 1973 that was in, within grasp in 1968. So because he undermined the Paris peace talks, the Vietnam War went on for five more years, and that cost 22,000 American lives and countless tens of thousands of Vietnamese, Cambodians, and Laotian lives. Uh, so when he, when he, of course, nobody knew about this when he got elected. Uh, while, so as he, as he takes office, uh, while announcing to America that he would begin to remove troops and end the war, of course, this is making all the young people at home very happy, uh, Nixon begins to secretly bomb Cambodia. So why would he do that? And here's a map of Cambodia, and each little red dot is a, is a bombing mission. So you can see that he pretty much obliterated half the country. <clears throat> The reason why he did it, North Vietnam had been launching attacks from inside Cambodia. In fact, they did so during the Tet Offensive. Although Cambodia had declared neutrality, they allowed North Vietnam access to their country. So for, for, for North Vietnam, it was much, a, a much shorter route to, to fly into South Vietnam from Cambodia than come down from North Vietnam. Uh, so on February 22, 1969, the North Vietnamese launched a new offensive against American forces in South Vietnam from bases in Cambodia. Uh, when Nixon found out about this, he took this as a personal slap in the face and sought retaliation. Uh, Nixon wanted to destroy the bases where these planes were launched from. Uh, aircraft, which makes sense. I mean, your war truly is kind of, in, in many cases, eye for an eye. And we still see uh, military retaliation today. Uh, if something like this happens, you, there's some kind of strike against the country, but not a, not a full-blown campaign like this, where you see that half the country's been, been bombed. Uh, you know, usually in a situation like this, the military plans a surgical strike and perhaps take out an airfield that allowed the North Vietnamese to take off from, because don't forget, they're, they're still neutral. It was perhaps a bad decision for Cambodia to allow Vietnam to do, North Vietnam to do that, but they're still neutral. Uh, so let's do a surgical strike and, and blow up the base that they flew out of, but as, as we'll see, that was not what Nixon did. Uh, he starts this whole new campaign and, and goes to war with another country. Uh, he consulted his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger. Uh, Kissinger shared Nixon's determination to respond aggressively. And the plan they came up with would have devastating and long-term effects. Their solution was to bomb Cambodia, the entirety of it, in hopes of not only destroying the North Vietnamese bases hidden in the Cambodia jungles, but for payback for, let, for allowing them to do that. Uh, but this was secret. Nobody knew about it. No, nobody uh, in America, Congress, uh, the military, nobody knew about this. And Nixon knew if it was ever leaked to the American public, he'd be in deep trouble. This is in, an impeachable offense. And a national chaos could be the result. But Nixon's frustration and patience grew. He was angry, much like Johnson responding to the Gulf of Tonkin incident, overreaction, and you start a full-scale war. Uh, Nixon said to Kissinger, we cannot tolerate one more of these without hitting back. Uh, so they determined to order the bombing of the country, but always remained worried about what might happen if the American public found out what he was doing. So Nixon and Kissinger worked tirelessly to make sure it remained a secret. 
and this is a, a comment from Nixon to Kissinger. No comment, no warnings, no complaints, no protests. I mean it. Not one thing to be said to anyone publicly or privately without my prior approval. Even the pilots in the, of the planes that carried the bombs were lied to about the location of their targets. And their missions were kept off the official flight logs. Uh, it, was, it was made to seem like they never actually happened. Nixon never consulted Congress. A, a president doesn't have that ability to just, you know, uh, start to wage a full-scale war against a country that you're not at war with. Uh, never consulted Congress. Even the, He even kept the bombings a secret from the high-ranking officials in the military. So imagine that the, the officials in the military don't know this is going on. So on May 18, 1969, the U.S. military, under direct orders from the president, began to bomb Cambodia in absolute defiance of the American public and Congress. Uh, the operation was called Operation Menu, and the first set of bombing runs was called Breakfast, and the breakfast bombings were hailed uh, a success by Nixon and Kissinger, privately, of course. Uh, Nixon sent uh Kissinger a, a private note we should let them have it again crack the hell out of them so he's enjoying himself uh, this this of course would result uh, for many years in in some you know uh, t issues with between Cambodia and the United States the, the Cambodians aren't very happy about this and and you know f still have a grudge against America for doing this uh, let's go to our next film. Please watch the film, Why Does, the Cam Why Does Cambodia Hate the U.S.? And then come on back. Okay, so, so just, just, for a, just for a quick, a quick review. Uh, the Nixon administration secretly ordered bombings on a country that America was not at war with without the consent of Congress or the knowledge of the American people. And these air raids were, had code names like lunch, snack, dinner, supper, desert and those followed the breakfast bombings and concluded finally operation menu but his fatal decision to keep it secret would have disastrous effects uh, I'm sorry domestic I'll get it disastrous domestic and foreign consequences and would be a point of contention between Cambodia and America for many years to come as we saw in the film but Nixon proclaimed the bombing of Cambodia was the most successful mil military operation of the entire war even though it was completely illegal and not really his you know he didn't have the, the uh, right or the power to, to do so when the media outlets finally found this out uh, this was a big big deal it was a huge story critics of the war became more vocal you know college students across the United States became increasingly outspoken in their opposition to the war and the demonstrations increased and became more heated. Congress immediately put an end to it. But amazingly, nobody called for Nixon's impeachment. This was a textbook case of abuse of power, lying to Congress and the American people. But Nixon was a hugely corrupt president. Uh, and this incident is not even the reason why he would resign. Uh, he would never learn. Abuse of power and pathological lying would come back to haunt him. So I mentioned when he was when he was elected that the young people were, no, I wouldn't say in support completely, but they were happy that the war was going to end and he was going to finally do it. Uh, but now they find out that he's doing this. So you can't trust him either. We, we couldn't trust Johnson. We, now we can't trust Nixon. Get these people out of here. And no, we're not going to go fight your war. Uh, so again, young people, what are we fighting for? And it's one, two, three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me. I don't give a damn. Next stop is Vietnam. Uh, you know, music starts to, uh, you know, protest this war. It's a, it's a huge movement. Uh, young people of the 60s, the baby boomers, rebelling against the government and American society in, in general that their parents built. You know, why are we fighting and dying for this war? We don't want to go f and fight and die for this war. The greatest generation of World War II had beaten Hitler and saved the world. And most of those soldiers, it was a segregated army then. Most of those soldiers were white and conservative. And now that they're older, they, they condoned the war in Vietnam to stop communism. And they tell their sons, serving in the military was a source of pride. 
Uh, and it should be. It's a huge commitment for anyone uh, to do, for someone to do to, to serve in the military. But the baby boomers say, but you were fighting Hitler. That made sense. I'd fight that, I'd fight that too. What are we fighting here? We don't know what we're fighting. We're, we're fighting this thing called communism. We don't want it to spread. And you're, you're saying it's going to take over the world. And I don't know if we trust you anymore. It, it feels to me like this war is being prolonged for profits. Lots of war contracts and defense contracts. And people are making a lot of money off this war. Uh, if we can keep it going, uh, people will get rich. And all it costs is just, what, some more American servicemen? So young people fight back. And another question was, this war has been going on for you know a long time. Uh, why can't America win this war? Where's the big plan? Uh, we remember D-Day, World War II, and island hopping in, in the Pacific, and, and they worked. But but this war is just endless bombing and guerrilla warfare. It's not accomplishing anything. So unlike their parents, the baby boomers, you know, are distrusting the government, distrusting the president, and distrusting their parents. People are dying, and for what? Uh, to, to line people's pockets at our expense, the expense of our lives. Uh, so students across the nation are radicalized, and the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, is formed, and they are called the New Left. They want change in American society, politics, and Vietnam. Uh, Tom Hayden of the California Senate, Senate and considered a radical, uh, speaks up. We are people of this generation, bred in at least modest comfort. Housed now in universities, looking uncomfortably at what we at the world we inherit. So I mentioned before, baby boomers, white families, you know, growing growing up in the suburbs in this kind of I, idealistic world that doesn't look at the real world. It's kind of like a dream world in the suburbs. Where everything's just kind of fine and fun. Uh, but now we're older. Now we're in universities, and we don't like what we see. We don't like the world that you've created. Now you want us to go fight for it. Uh, so the baby boomers are coming of age, and they don't like what they see. So the new left engulfed universities, and students radicalized, and they protested the escalation of the war, and they turned their back on capitalism and consumerism. Uh, but there were voices from the conservative students also, uh, much smaller in numbers, but you have the Young Americans for Freedom, uh, Christian-based ideology, they supported the war in Vietnam because of the, the potential spread of communism, and they also defended capitalism. But increased anti-war sentiment finally drove Nixon to remove troops. By 1971, there were only 140,000 troops left in Viet American troops left in Vietnam. And then finally, in 1973, uh, ceasefire was signed in Paris at those peace talks that he put off for five years. Uh, and this war came to a, a, an end, uh, at least the American, American involvement in it would come to an end. Uh, so not a victory, not, not a, you know, uh, a proud moment. It, you just kind of walk away from it and leave it, let it be. Uh, Nixon would, was embroiled in Watergate and it's just that whole thing kind of starting and he's in the midst of all that right now. So he's got he's got you know bigger fish to fry than 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 Vietnam. Uh, so the ceasefire happens in 1973, and for a year or two, it seems like this war is over uh, and done with. And I can tell you, as a as a person as a young man in high school in 1973, 74, I graduated in 74. Of course, all of us were watching closely because if if it comes back, we're going to get drafted. And, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, and then it happens. 1975, uh, North Viet Vietnam captures Saigon. They invade and capture Saigon. And this brought about some harsh realities. Uh, you know, American combat forces have been out of the war for about two years. You know, after that ceasefire agreement with the North. And when the ceasefire happened, Nixon had promised the South Vietnamese that the United States would respond in full force if the North violated the ceasefire, but they violated it and nothing happened. By this time, Nixon was powerless. By this time, Nixon was for, already been forced out of office and was disgraced by the Watergate scandal. 
So you know you have a situation where America pulls out of a country that they've been fighting a war at for many many years. So you know we we recently had the same thing happen uh, uh, in a similar situation in Afghanistan, evacuating Afghanistan and the disaster that that was. Uh, so it's very similar to what happened in um, Saigon. Um, uh, Afghanistan is America's longest war in history. Two decades of combat since 9-11. Uh, trillions of dollars spent. Tens of thousands of lives lost. And the debate over Afghanistan isn't really over even if the war is. So the Taliban's rapid takeover has created a number of new questions. So as, as, the, as the United States pull out, the Taliban takes over quickly. Uh, and of course that you know the the Taliban has been involved in in, in lots of the terrorist you know incidents 9/11 themselves. Uh, so was the war off or not? Uh, were U.S. efforts a failure? What's next for Afghanistan? Uh, how how will an Afghanistan uh, run by a fundamentalist Islamic militant group affect U.S. national security? Uh, of course, as we know, the, the evacuation was a bit of a disaster for Biden, uh, causing people's faith in him to plummet. Many people were killed. Uh, some suicide bombing. Uh, people were left behind that had been loyal to the United States. Uh, if Trump had been, had been reelected, and of course he believes he was, uh, he was planning on evacuating Afghanistan back in April and May of 2021. Would the evacuation have gone better under his guidance? And he, he thinks so. But the truth is, evacuating a country is not very easy, and chaos is not atypical. And the chances are that even if Trump had done it, it would have resulted in, this, in the same, same thing. So let, let's get back to our era here. I just kind of took a segue there because it's similar. So South Vietnam lost the war, uh, and in the end, the communists won. And, um, of course, what about the Truman Doctrine? You know, what, what about that? It seems like they're, they're winning more than they're losing. Uh, Cuba, China, now Vietnam. What about the domino theory? This idea that if Vietnam fell, they all would fall. Well, no other country fell to communism. Uh, the domino theory really did not happen. Uh, so what is the legacy of Vietnam? Over 200,000 American casualties. 58,000 dead, 153,000 wounded. So hardly World War II, right? But tens of thousands of American men were killed. And for what? You know, a policy of containment? The Truman Doctrine? Is it, it, was it all about the policies of white men that, that are lining their pockets? Because that's what young people felt. Is that what it was? Uh, and, of course, we, we know that the response was many young people turned against society and we're not going to be part of your society of war and, and profit and capitalism. Uh, and they start a counterculture that's, of course, you know, with, with drugs and, and uh, free love and all kinds of you know, expression, long hair, uh, uh, music that, that, you know, uh, is about their lifestyle. Uh, and they have the ideology of turn on, tune in, and drop out. So turn on meant to take drugs and have sex, lots of sex to get in touch with your consciousness. Tune in meant to be in harmony with the world around you. <clears throat> uh, drop out did not mean to drop out of college like many of the greatest generation believed. Um, it meant to lead the society of war. Uh, youth discrimination, consumerism, capitalism, and like I said, music defined this generation. Artists stoked the fires with their songs. Uh, let's let's watch a short film here about the hippies. Please watch the film. Hippies change the gener generation, and then come on back. <clears throat> okay, so 1967 was called the Summer of Love, where this lifestyle reached its peak. Uh, but then 1968 exploded, and everything changed. And we've talked about most of this. The Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy both assassinated months apart in 1968. Uh, the Tet Offensive uh, meant that the United States was not doing very well in this war. And, of course, the world asks, why not? You're the most powerful military in the world. 
1968, the anti-war movement was at its zenith. And it didn't matter whether you were Republican or Democrat, the youths were against both. Uh, they had a riot at the Chicago Democratic Convention we talked about, uh, protesting the escalated war. They chose the Democratic Convention because Lyndon Johnson, Johnson was bombing endlessly, it seemed. So it was, it was in protest against him. The students had had enough, and they made a stand, knowing, of course, that it would all be on TV. And we, we saw that, that film uh, with the... Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to watch that film right now. With the whole world's watching, the whole world's watching. <clears throat> so they find they, they formed a line in protest, screaming, Peace now with the peace sign. It used to be the victory sign, now it's the peace sign. The police showed up in riot gear and forcibly removed the crowd with batons. So we, we've heard about this before. Uh, the, the march on Selma, Birmingham, fire hoses, batons, you know, beating people. But this time it wasn't black people. This time it was mostly middle class white kids who were students. So when you when you watch the, the clip we're going to watch here in a minute, uh, in the beginning you can hear the crowd yelling, peace now, peace now, peace now. But towards the end, you hear the whole world's watching, the whole world's watching, because TV's filming this, and they know that the world is watching these police beat them up. Please watch the film, the 1968 Chicago Police versus Protesters, and then come on back. Okay, so, so volatile times, you know, anti-war, and the civil rights movement made a lethal combination in the 1960s. And celebrities and sports figures get involved in the protests. Uh, Muhammad Ali, I mentioned him before, formerly known as Cassius Clay, the heavyweight champion of the world. He refused to serve in the military. He said his religion of the nation of Islam did not believe in war. And he called himself a CO or a conscientious objector. Uh, so because of freedom of religion in this country, if your religion is against war, you don't have to serve in the military, even if you're drafted. Uh, you can call yourself a conscientious objector. So, so Ali tries to do that. And he says, wars against the teachings of the Quran. I'm not trying to dodge the draft. We are not supposed to take part in no wars unless declared by Allah or the messenger. We don't take part in Christian wars or wars of any unbelievers. Uh, but, but he also had another reason. Going back to the question. How can America claim to be fighting for freedom when their own people are abused and tortured at home? This is another quote from Ali. Man, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. Why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? So that's, he's, he's saying it uh, you know, pretty clearly. Uh, yeah, Ali becomes a very popular, uh, you know, kind of leader of this of this anti-war movement. Uh, this next film clip shows him at his best and why he became a galvanizing person for the anti-war movement. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, tell you the title, but this is the title. Please watch that film, and you see Ali standing up to. You know, some white students that probably are a lot more educated than him, but he's got something to say and he says it. Go ahead and watch this film. Okay, so powerful words. Very shocking. No Viet Cong ever called me the N-word. Wow. No Viet Cong ever lynched me. No Viet Cong ever raped my mother. Uh, but you want me to go fight them, even though you've done those things to, to me and my people here in the United States. You've done all those things. But you want me, a black man, to go across the world and fight you know, what he calls brown people in Vietnam. Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. So how does that affect you? That, that this, this is the kind of the, the, uh, kind of the, the ultimate uh, you know, moment of, the, of these things two opposing opinions, young people and the greatest generation, and their opinions come, come to a climax here. And there's Ali, the center stage, the spokesperson. So he would become a leading spokesperson in the 60s for civil rights and anti-war. Uh, mostly hated by white America, seen as, as another symbol of black power. So the conservatives and the greatest generation didn't care for him at all. This would actually change as he would grow older, uh, 
you know, he uh, became ill in his later years and, and uh, you know, would, was, uh, uh, couldn't speak very well, would shake, uh, but famously lit the torch at the Olympics uh, a, a, a few Olympics ago and became more of a um, more of an American hero today today or towards his death than he was was then but back then he was not seen like that he was not liked at all by by most of the older generation of white Americans uh, but he was a bold and defiant voice in the black community and it gave other blacks the courage to speak up and be heard and just like Malcolm X just like Marcus Garvey just like W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, on and on. Uh, no more deference, no more acquiescence, no more humble servitude. Uh, stand up and fight for what is rightfully yours. So Ali turns away from Martin Luther King and kind of shades more towards the Malcolm X point of view. Uh, Ali took on the characteristics of Malcolm X, not Martin Luther King, not anti-violence. If they're going to come at me with violence, let's hit them back with violence. Okay, that's the end of chapter 28. Thank you.